Hello, I'm John Eldridge, and welcome to the Ransomed Heart audio podcast. For more information on Ransomed Heart Ministries, our resources and events, please visit us online at www.ransomedheart.com. I woke up this morning at like 3 o'clock in the morning because our house was filled with smoke. Um, And for those of you who were following the news back in June, late June and July, you know that there's uh, been a huge wildfire raging just west of Colorado Springs, certain parts of Colorado Springs that had to be evacuated. And both Craig and I um, live right against the National Forest on the west side. You can't get much more west than our backyards, and uh, which puts us kind of directly in the line of an advancing fire. Really grateful to say it's not here, uh, not that close. Um, we may hear some of the the big planes going over this morning, uh, dropping, uh, you know, chemicals and suppressants on the fire. And um, but uh, it it smells a little smoky in the studio here as well. <laughs> so so just to give some context to um, to the recording this morning, this is this is taking place in the midst of uh, of a wildfire burning on the uh, on the outside of town here. Welcome, friends. I'm John Eldridge, Craig McConnell with me. Our cars are actually packed with certain valuables in case we are placed on a evacuation notice. But otherwise, uh, g- glad to be here. And, and we're continuing a recording in a series on how did Jesus look at life? How did Jesus look at, at uh, people, God, um, the world, gender, justice, the future, sex, church, you know? There goes one of the big planes. How did Jesus look at life? That That's not a plane. That's actually Craig's indigestion. <laughs> so, um, so welcome back. Um, we are delighted to be doing this, enjoying it, loving it. And, and uh, thank you for your feedback, uh, listeners, um, friends. Uh, love it. Just posts that you've sent in on Facebook and, and letting us know that, uh, that you're really enjoying it, too. So... Without any further introduction, here was the analogy that I wanted to give this morning as we push into some more topics here, um, particularly this one, particularly today's topic, um, which is uh, we'll do a couple of weeks on how, do, how does Jesus look at people? What are Jesus's assumptions about mankind, human beings? Um, and do our assumptions line up with that? Um, the the image that I got this morning was of a trapeze artist, the old – or the high wire axe mm-hmm. um, years ago. Uh, if you'd, you know, seen kind of the the people that would walk the high wire. Do you remember they used to have a long pole sure. with them and it extended way out to their right and way out to their left? Yeah. Um, and, and it was for the purposes of balance. Um, And I was struck by that this morning because as I was reflecting on some passages, which we'll cover here, um, Jesus's assumptions about people feel dramatically um, diverse, might not be the right word, Um, contrary, almost feels truer. Uh, For example, what we'll get into is um, Jesus makes some assumptions about people and their value, the the inestimable value of a human being. Um, but at the same time, or sometimes even in the next breath, Jesus will reveal his assumptions that he thinks people are basically evil. Mm-hmm. And you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, unless you hold both. You can't walk that high wire. You can't, you can't walk in a sort of integrated, whole, balanced view of how Jesus looked at human beings. So we're going to try that today. I feel like I'm on the high wire and I have a very short <laughs> stick, but we're going to try and get Jesus' perspective on these things. Anyhow, that's, that's the picture that I have this morning. Does that ring true for you as you've been thinking about 
Jesus's view of human beings. Yeah, that's a great picture, John. The balance, two things being true, kind of the tension. Right. When you just introduced the idea of, I wonder how Jesus sees people. Um, what struck me was uh, he sees things I don't see. Mm. And uh, mm. those those two categories that you hit on is uh, he sees sin that I don't see and mm -hmm. brokenness in people. Mm -hmm. and then he sees a glory and something just astonishingly beautiful in people. Mm. And I tend to either see one or the other or miss them both. Yes. So... Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's it's true. He's yes. somehow able to, I think he sees both in us. Yes, yes. Okay, let's start with this. I was, I was thinking through some of the scriptures on what does Jesus say about people? What, what are those passages that reveal his assumptions? Here was one that felt really big to me, and it takes place early in the Gospel of John, chapter 2. And uh, it says, uh, beginning with verse 23, now while he was in Jerusalem, while Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. Yeah. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. And you just go, whoa, that is such a lonely verse, among other things. It's such a sober, sad verse. I mean, the context of the verse is Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's doing these miraculous signs. Many people are believing in him, but, and then there's just kind of this, well, hang on, gang, you know. Hang on with the enthusiasm. Hang on with the, you know, let me qualify the good news with, but Jesus wouldn't entrust himself to them, to man, for he knew it was in man. And here is this honest assessment, this honest assumption Jesus is making about man and that um, he's basically, man is basically not trustworthy. Man is not basically good. Mm -hmm. And this is a mother, guys. This this is sort of a, the mother of all assumptions in some ways. It, it It's going to affect your views of community, church, government. It'll affect your views of parenting, discipline. It'll affect your views of um, the prison system, justice, the law, punishment. I mean, Jesus is making an assumption. He's saying, I'm just so thrilled that that you're all responding to me, but I don't trust you. Yeah. I'm surprised you went there first, John. I think there was a part of me half expecting where you would go is Jesus' great love of us and just seeing something noble in us. Why do you think why do you think I went here first? Do you have a hunch? Well, um, I think um, most of us, including myself, um, find it easier to be cynical. And I find it quite easy to view people as kind of sinners, broken, untrustworthy. Um, nope. That's, nope. That's not why I went there. Oh, I, no, I don't know why. Well, Craig, you are too deeply grounded in the scriptures. Um, but I would say I think you're rare and I think you're odd frankly, uh -huh. in really good ways. Craig, really? Do you think, what's the general assumption in the culture right now toward people? Are they basically good or basically evil? Oh, basically good. Exactly. That's why I went here yeah. this morning. Let's start here because part of what we're trying to do is look at the way Jesus looks at the world so that it, it sort of like smelling salts snaps us out of the cultural malaise that we live in 
You know, I'm just, I was just on Yahoo the other morning, just taking a quick look at the news. And one of the headlines was, you know, the appeal of the prosecutors and, you know, a, a criminal case that this criminal um, who was clearly guilty of multiple murders not be sentenced to prison or death, but that he be assigned to a mental institution. You know, and again, the, you know, the, the assumptions behind that is, you know, that there aren't issues of evil to be dealt with. It's just brokenness. It's, you know, and so I think our culture basically assumes that people are good, mm-hmm. right? And and just this soft, just this soft assumption that therefore everyone's going to heaven, all roads eventually lead to God, you know, um, gosh, you know, Aunt Mary, she was just such a good person, you know, no, she... She never actually acknowledged the existence of God, and she kind of lived life on her own terms. And, well, yeah, you know, she could be a little bit of a snit now and then, and she was absolutely insufferable to live with. But she was such a good person. You hear that? Yeah. 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 So that, don't you think that's the cultural assumption? Yeah. And you've expressed some, but, um, you know, where does that come out? I guess that comes out in... And, um, you know, our different views on punishment, and discipline. Oh, my and, gosh. Just boundaries for your children. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And even how you view yourself in terms of uh, um, introspection, scrutiny. Yes. Um, you know, the assumption that my motives are always good or pure or right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Or how about this? How about this? If... I think even for our own community, this might be a little disruptive. Um, what's the deeper issue, sin or brokenness? I do want to differentiate those. If, mm-hmm. if you've hung around the ransomed heart message for any length of time, we do talk about brokenness. We do talk about the healing work of Christ. We think Isaiah 61 is one of the key passages on the ministry of Jesus there is brokenness in people. There is woundedness, you know, mm-hmm. that, that sexual abuse, that, that divorce of your parents, the chronic pain you've been in, the, the things that damage the human soul, you know, that tour of duty in overseas, you know, on and on these go, the loss of a child. Um, those are real categories. Mm-hmm. And, and Jesus has a deep ministry to those categories. But... This would be another way of flushing this assumption. What's the deeper issue, sin or brokenness, according to Christ? What's the more serious issue, according to Christ? Yeah, it'd be sin. It'd be sin. But I so quickly go to brokenness. Right, don't we? (laughs) Don't we? And I think the world sure does. Which, when I go to brokenness, it's compassion. Exactly. It's mercy. Exactly. Understanding. Right, yeah. And so... You know, just as an example of this criminal doesn't need, you know, justice done upon them. What they need is sort of compassionate understanding for their mental instability. That would be a good example. But another one would be, you know, take it home to, you know, little Susie, three years old, who throws the tantrum. What's operating there? Oh, that's not that's not sin. That's just she's having a hard day. You know, and it'll affect your parenting styles and and boundaries that you draw for your children. But again, friends, I know I know we're kind of pushing into some things here, but I just want to start with that passage. Jesus did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in man. And, and I mean, my goodness, you take some of his interactions with the Jewish people. You know, talking about their hard hearts, their corrupt hearts, their, um, you know, deceitful motives, their high rebellion against God himself. I mean, Jesus' assessment, one of, again, think of the trapeze pole, the the high wire pole, you know, one assessment is of Jesus is that people are basically evil. Mm Mm-hmm. Stunning too. Uh, I'm sure some people listening are are frightened of uh, that category because they fear it will take them judging others. I yeah. mean, how do you reconcile that with being a loving person, right? 
Um, right. Jesus doesn't sound immediately vulnerable in that passage. Yes. Um, yes. He's acting on a knowledge and understanding and assumption about people that, I mean, how are we supposed to live with that really? I mean, what's that look like? Yeah. Huh? Yes. Yes. In Friends, there is the cross. There is redemption. There is forgiveness. There is the blood of Christ. But even there, it broke my heart uh, recently in a conversation with a friend who is the president of a seminary. Um, and a seminary that might kind of be considered to be a little bit more progressive or trying to be culturally relevant while holding on to uh, a scriptural view of the world. But we were talking about the cross and it was around Easter. And, and he said, oh, most of our students, they don't look at the cross as, as atonement anymore. That They look of it as the cross is Jesus's sharing in man's suffering. Jesus identifying with our with our pain. Mm -hmm. That is horrifying. The cross was not necessary for God to identify with our pain. Mm -hmm. The cross is the atonement mm -hmm. for sin, you know, and therefore hope and forgiveness and joy. And we'll get to the other side of this, of this balancing, you know, rod on the high wire. But, but even there, I mean, even just... The value of the cross is is shifted and altered to some sort of compassionate act of God sharing in our suffering. If you don't hold Jesus's one of Jesus's core assumptions about people, and and that is man's basically evil. Yeah. And the thing is, Craig, here I understand. I understand that perhaps. You can live your life without experiences that make this absolutely clear to you. But I do not understand how any parent can. <sighs> I mean, come on. We spent a delightful weekend a few weeks ago with a, a family with some young children. And it was just a joy to be around young ones again, you know, with our, our boys off uh, in college or graduating from college. And and uh, to be around little four-year-olds and six-year-olds. We had a ball. But at one point, the boys didn't know, these, these little guys didn't know that I was watching. And I was watching the older brother just manipulate in the most cunning way his younger brothers so that he got to ride the bike first, you know. <laughs> And just the way he was, you know, distorting their understanding of what would be fun and, you know, it would be funner if they got to go second and that kind of thing. And just watching, I mean, this this little boy using absolute cunning to manipulate his world to get what he wants. You know, parents at least have to know this. I mean, you did not teach your children to lie, yes. but they lie. You do not teach your children to rebel, but they rebel. You know, you say it's nine o'clock bedtime and, you know, they're pushing the limits and all of that, all of that. You know, like you've got to be kidding me. How in the world do we hold on to yes. the assumption that people are still basically good? As you're saying that, John, I, I realize um... – I react to news of pastors falling, serial killers, um, political corruption, and all of that. I still, there's a, some part of me that reacts in shock, horror, and disbelief. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember in seminary, an old uh, prof, and uh, there was something atrocious that happened in the news, and the whole class uh, was talking about it. And... He just as calmly and as matter-of-factly as he could possibly be just simply said, well, if you um, properly understand man's sin, you cease to be surprised by the horrors of this world. Just as we're talking, I'm realizing my anger and shock, disappointment and frustration with people. I mean, where is that yes. coming from? Yes. Some of that is from this assumption that people are good. I'm shocked by it. Yes. Versus yes. someone who rightly has appraised yes. the world, life, and people and understands. Yes. This is what 
this world is going to yeah, be like. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, friends, track with us. Stay with us because let me clarify for a moment what we're not saying. Um, Jesus does not hold the assumption that every human being is thoroughly evil, right? I mean, his encounter with Nathaniel after he saw him under the fig tree, he says, here is a true Israelite in whom nothing is false, in whom there is no false thing or in whom there is no guile. I mean, you know, in the parable of the sower and the seed, there's different kinds of soil, right? And he actually gets down to a good soil and talks about the noble and good heart. So I want to make sure that Jesus does not assume, therefore, that people have no capacity for good. He does not assume that, you know, in the midst of this fire uh, in Colorado Springs and people needing to be evacuated. Uh, you know, the latest news bulletin was the Red Cross shelter was saying, please stop bringing food and donations we don't need anymore. You know, I mean, what a beautiful thing. The community rushing to help one another and and uh, our neighbors offering to help us pack the other day. I mean, yes, of course, yes. of course. So hear us when we're talking about this category, which is absolutely essential to understanding people. You know, we're not saying, therefore, man is utterly, thoroughly, totally corrupt. I think Jesus's view of people is that they are corrupt in different ways and to different degrees. You know, when he's talking about a uh, passage that we quoted earlier about divorce, um, you know, he says it was because of your hardness of hearts. You know, and he's talking to the Pharisees, talking to the Jews, and, and he says, you have hard hearts, you know. But then he encounters the woman at the well, and to her, you know, he seems to appeal more to her thirst and her need and her brokenness, and he doesn't even bring up, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery. He does not quote the law to her. So just again, we'll get to the balancing rod here, but but you do need to hear, friends, that, you know, your assumptions about this issue, are people basically good or evil, are really going to shape what you think needs to be done in the world. For example, the rush to justice lately and Christians, you know, going off to corners of the world to you know, where is your chocolate from? And is your chocolate, you know, harvested in, in such ways as, as are unjust to workers and children? And, you know, where do your coffee beans come from and the shoes that you wear and the food that you eat, etc.? But friends, please, please, you must understand if you hold to this assumption that people are basically evil, then you understand that nothing short of a presentation of the gospel is going to remedy those situations. And yes, 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 you bet justice needs to be done. And I mean, I, I give to conservation causes and all sorts of things. And I'm, I'm a conscientious eater and shopper and all that. I believe in that. However, the problem with these efforts is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm watching good-hearted Christians go off into, you know, some of these service projects around the world, digging wells or that sort of thing and going, but where's the presentation of the gospel? Because if you're not bringing as the primary answer salvation through Jesus Christ and a change of heart, God changing the nature of man, you will never fix these problems. Never. You know, you can oust one dictator, but you'll just put another in his place. Yeah. If you do not address the fundamental issue that the heart of man is evil and needs to be changed by salvation, by the coming of the Spirit of God to regenerate the heart of man, you are tinkering. You are rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. You know, the, all of these other solutions. And what's so heartbreaking is this is where the church is investing its time right now. Yes. It's not in the presentation of the gospel, not primarily. Oh, no, it's in showing the world what great folk we are by serving in the soup kitchen, you know. It's trying to show everybody that we're really loving and caring. When you go, look, that is not going to change the world. That's not going to rectify the problems if you hold this assumption. The problem, the issue, and the solution all center on the heart. Yes, and what you believe about the heart. Yeah. You know, and this is going to affect everything from your parenting style yeah. to uh, the candidates you put in office and your view of justice to... You know, how you try and, and stop the slave trade 
which is booming around the world. So what's the question to leave our listeners with in terms of, uh, is it simply, how do you really view man? Here's a couple that we've touched on today, Craig. One was yours. What shocks you? Mm -hmm. What shocks you? Really? Are you really shocked by evil? And then the question would be, why? Mm -hmm. Why? If you hold this view. And then another question would be, what do you primarily turn to as the solution? Are you trying to fix brokenness? Or are you trying to That's deal bad. with sin? You know, again, in, in, any, in any context, whether it's friendship, parenting, church breakups, politics, you know, global corporations, what, what are you trying to deal with here? Is it primarily brokenness, which is a category, or is it primarily sin, which is a very, very different category? Okay, we got to pause just because we want to keep going on this. And so come back, listen next week, because I want to bring in the other side of, of this particular balancing act on the high wire. And, and then I want to add a couple more categories that I think will further um, enrich how did Jesus look at people. This is John Eldridge and Craig McConnell. Again, thanks for joining us. You've been listening to the Ransomed Heart podcast. And for more, I want to invite you to two places. Come to our Facebook page. If you haven't dropped by there recently, oh my goodness, those stories are going to be so encouraging just to read some of the wonderful, wonderful reports of what God is doing in people's lives. And I just think you'll find the community there really enriching. And you can also get you know updates on things that we're doing. And then, uh, of course, come to our website at ransomedheart.com.